Can the kids come up for ch the kids' chat? I know there's some of you out there. So, do you guys know what's coming up this week? No, that's coming up soon, but it's not it's not this week. Do you know? Yeah, St. Patrick's Day. Now, do you guys know anything about St. Patrick? No? All right, well, when he was a little older than you, not, not as old as me, but a little older than you guys, he was taken from his parents. And he was sent to a place, and he had to do everybody's chores. Would you like that? No? You wouldn't like that? Well... Whenever he, eventually he left those people and went back to his home. And then he got called by God to go into the ministry and go back to those people. Now, do you, now if somebody hurt you real bad, do you think it'd be easy to go back to them and, and be nice to them? What, what was your question? We're talking about St. Patrick. Patrick? Yeah, his name's Patrick. He's made a, he's called St. Patrick because of a bunch of old people real long ago said he was a saint. <laughs> yeah, that's not his but his name was Patrick. And and he went back to those people, and he forgave them for all the mean things they did to him, and he taught them about Jesus. And you want to know why his, his symbol is the clover? Because that's how he taught people about Jesus and the Trinity. Each petal is a different piece of the Trinity, but it's part of the same flower. So I'm going to give you guys today your own clovers. Do you want your own clovers? Yeah? All right. Well, whenever you look at your clover, can you do me a favor? Can you think of, when you, th when you see the clover, can you think of Patrick and how he had to forgive people for all the mean things they did to him and how he taught them about Jesus and how we should be like Jesus as well, who forgave people? So when you look at the clover, think of forgiveness and the forgiveness God gives you for doing the bad things that you might do, but I'm sure you're all perfect. Parents, are they perfect? Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm sure. All right, can we have a prayer? All right, close your eyes. God, thank you for everything you've given us today, and please help us remember your servant, St. Patrick, and how he forgave people, and how we should forgive them as well, and teach people about Jesus and his great forgiveness. Amen. All right, you guys can go ahead down. Good morning. How good it is to be in God's house and lift our voices together in a time of prayer and praise and adoration. By the way, the old people who named Patrick the Saint does not include Tom Lucas and I. We, we are old, but not quite that old. If you have your Bible today, I'm going to invite you to turn to the book of Numbers. Numbers chapter 21 and beginning with verse 4 and reading through verse 9. And then looking in the Gospel of John. Numbers chapter 21 and beginning with verse 4. They, meaning the Israelites, traveled from Mount Hor along the route to the Red Sea to go around Edom. But the people grew impatient on the way. They spoke against God and against Moses and said, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the desert? There is no bread, there is no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. They bit the people and many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. 
The Lord said to Moses, make a snake and put it on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it on a pole. Then when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, he lived. And then turning to the Gospel of John chapter 3 and beginning with verse 14 and reading through verse 21. John chapter 3 and beginning our reading with verse 14. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe in him stands condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light, so that it may be seen plainly what he has done and has been done through God. May God's blessing be added to the reading and the hearing of his word. I've preached from this text, these two texts of scripture a number of times, and the Lord has brought me back there again, because I believe we need to be reassured and affirms that God has our best interest in mind. However, we, like the people of Israel, have a tendency to grumble and complain. I'm waiting for the amen there, but... Yeah, there we go, thank you. Because we do grumble and complain. Hasn't it been a long winter? Didn't it rain a lot on Friday night and Saturday morning? I'm tired of eating the same thing over and over and over again. Can't they fix the potholes? I don't care what our complaint is, we complain. And not just about those things. God, why am I going through what I'm going through right at this moment? I don't deserve this. You're right. You don't. What we deserve is to die. God grants to us the hope of life and the hope of life everlasting through Jesus Christ. When the Israelite people were in Egypt and were held captive there and were slaves there, they cried out to God and God heard their cry and God raised up a man who well, you and I would not have picked. He raised up a man named Moses and Moses went to Pharaoh and after a long period of time, and I don't have time to talk about all of that, They finally said, go, and then he changed his mind and pursued. The people of Israel got to the Red Sea. God miraculously parted the Red Sea. They crossed on dry ground. The waters of the Red Sea closed over the Egyptian army. Wouldn't you realize God is on your side? They got on the other side, and they began the journey towards the promised land, the land that they're forefathers had received as an inheritance from God. And in the midst of that journey, they begin to grumble and complain. They say, we don't have any food. We don't have, we've run out of food. We've run out of water. God provides water for them from a rock. He provides manna for them, which is like the dew that covers the ground. It's that mysterious thing that they pick up and eat, and it provides nourishment for them. It is sweet. It tastes like honey. How could you possibly complain when your food tastes like honey? But they managed to. Oh, 
All of us have complained about our food at one point in time or another, haven't we? I have a particular remembrance that comes to mind of when I was a child and, uh, and our dad was working second shift and uh, mom had made potato soup. I don't like potato soup. Still don't like potato soup. Don't invite me to your home for potato soup. <laughs> I got to the table that day and mom had potato soup for supper. And I complained about the potato soup and I made this comment. I'd sooner eat cold beans like the cowboys did than potato soup. She sent me to the bathroom to rewash. You know, when you're of the age, you don't necessarily get as clean as mom wants you to. And when I came back to the table, there sitting in front of me was a container of cold beans which I ate, we complain. It's in our nature. Not just about our food, but sometimes about our life. The Israelites complained. Even though God had provided everything that they needed, even though he had given them the escape from Egypt, even though he had brought them miraculously across the bottom of the Red Sea on dry ground, even though he had provided water from the rock and manna every morning for them, he nourished them and refreshed them, they complained. They became very melancholy over what life was like for them. They said, oh, that we were back in Egypt again and eating from the melons on the Nile. Really? You want to go back to Egypt? You want to eat melons from the Nile? You remember you were slaves there. You were treated unmercifully. You were beaten and persecuted. You were not free. And God is in the midst of redemption and setting you free. And you're going to choose to... Yeah. Complain. God puts you on a bus to the promised land and you complain that the air condition isn't working. So God said, okay, fine, no problem. You want to complain? I give you something to complain about. When Sarah was a little girl, occasionally, you know, children will cry and sometimes it's the alligator tears. She'd cry about something, and I'd look at her, and I'd say, Sarah, if you want to cry, I'll give you something to cry about. She didn't like that. I don't either when God says that to me. You want to complain? I'll give you something to complain about. And he sends venomous snakes among them, and the venomous snakes bite them, and some people died. I mean, this is serious stuff. It's not just getting bit by a snake. It's getting bit by a snake and dying. What does it take for God to get our attention? What kind of venomous snake does it take for us? And so the people come humbly before Moses. They've complained against God and against Moses. They come to Moses and say, Moses, we've sinned. Would you please go to God on our behalf and ask him to take away the snakes? Now notice this. God does not take away the snakes. But instead provides salvation. He provides a solution for the snakes. He says to Moses, make a snake and put it on a stick and have someone hold it up. And when people get bit by the snake, if they look up and they keep their eyes fixed on that snake on the stick, they will live. Wouldn't it have just been easier to take the snakes away? 
Yes. But isn't the lesson learned that we need to look to God for the answer and for every other issue in life? If God would have taken away the snakes and not had any more snakes again, by the way, a lot of you would vote for that. If God would take away the snakes from the Israelites in the middle of that desert, guess what would have happened? They'd have grumbled and complained again. God does not choose to take sin away from us. He chooses to take us away from sin. Did you hear that? He gives us an answer. And the answer is to look up. If you go into a hospital today, a doctor's office, a medical clinic, you see an ambulance, they all have a symbol of the snake and the stick. It's called the caduceus. Sometimes it even looks like a cross with a snake wrapped around it. Did you ever think about, isn't that a strange symbol for healing? It's a biblical answer. Jesus knows why he has come. There is no doubt in his mind why Jesus has come and lives in this world among us, and that is he provides for us that which we cannot do for ourselves. He provides salvation through faith in him. He's speaking to a man named Nicodemus, who is one of Israel's teachers, a member of the Sanhedrin, one of the 67. And he says to Nicodemus, Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever lives and believes in him will never die. Many of us have memorized John 3.16, and that's a good verse to memorize. If you've not, I'd encourage you to. But 14 and 15 are pretty good also. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. The symbol of the cross for us is the symbol of Christianity, is it not? You drive down through any town or city and you see a building that has a steeple on the top or a cupola, or anything else, and if you look on top and you see a cross, you know, don't you? You know. Now, a church may be identified by something else other than a cross, but it is common for us to see a cross. In this Lenten season, our cross adorns the sanctuary. And it's a cross that reminds us of the shame of Jesus Bearing my sin and yours. None of his, for he is without sin. But he willingly takes mine and yours and dies. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. For what looks to us as utter defeat is in, in fact the great moment of victory. When Jesus is crucified on that cross, it looks to the world like he's lost. But what really it is, is we're saved. Have you ever heard the expression, 
someone is snake bit? What does that mean? Perhaps it means we're, we're timid. We don't, we're afraid. We don't, we don't want to say anything. Fearful that someone will snap out at us just like a snake will. So we quietly withdraw. Afraid of saying anything, afraid of doing the right thing because Someone might be offended. Someone might want to attack us. And we sit in silence when instead we could speak. The world is waiting for you and I to share Jesus. That's how God has chosen to do this. Could he have chosen something else? Sure. Could he have chosen to take the snakes away? Sure. But he chooses you and me to step forward and to hold up the cross of Christ to those who are being bitten by the venomous sin and snakes of their life. To look at our neighbors, our family, our friends, to hold up that cross and say, look and believe. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Do you? Pray with me. Heavenly Father, help us to speak boldly for Jesus. To share the remedy of sin when we see it in the lives of a family member, a friend, a neighbor. When they're complaining about what's happening in their life, do we give them the remedy of Jesus? For we've all been bitten by that snake. And we know that our answer is Jesus himself. Help us to be bold to share Jesus with others. When the sting of sin has bitten them. Amen.